even when I had moments where I was very close to like throwing in the towel and just saying I, I quit this acting thing something in me was like you don't have to chuck it all away it can just it can be dormant for a little bit and then it will come back you know you can have a quiet period and it'll come back in a way that is organic and authentic Hello, Bold Ones, and welcome to the Act Bold Podcast. Today, I have a very dear friend and colleague. His name is Angus McGrither. He is an Australian actor who lives and works in Berlin as an actor and a voiceover actor. And he is now the director of the Down Under Film Festival, also located in Berlin. Angus, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much for coming on. Cool. Thanks for grabbing me and getting me on. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I am always fascinated with actors who are looking to like, you know, put on like a real multi hyphenate hat. And I think that that's what you've definitely done with Mala, right? Mala is also the co-director, Mala Gadia, in that, you know, you're now taking on the role of film festival directors, which is pretty much a full-time job, no? Or at least part of the year it is. So tell me a little bit about how that came about. It's definitely something that we've had to grow into because it's not something that uh, we, you know, we're looking for. The Down Under Film Festival has been around for many years, I think since 2011. And I had been many times and it's always a great fun event in Berlin at the end of the summer and um, you know I I sort of enjoyed going there just as a punter and as a you know person who works in the film industry and obviously a supporter of Australian film and New Zealand film um, but then we were approached during the lockdown when the team that was running it was um, they were stepping down and they were basically saying that they would love the festival con to continue and we wouldn't want the festival to, uh, yeah, to fold as a result of them stepping down. So uh, we, Marla and I had done a podcast previously, which was focused on Australian artists who were living and working in Berlin. So we were kind of known in the creative community and in this, you know, by the Australian expat community as the kind of the duo and um and so they they approached us together and said would this be interesting and we said yes basically because we couldn't think of a good reason to say no mm -hmm. <laughs> and then found out after the fact how much is involved in running a film festival even something at a very grassroots level which it, it has been for many years it would be considered one of the smaller festivals but still quite well known and it's at a quite a well-known venue. So um, it was very much a learn-as-you-go process. And it's been a great way for us as actors and as artists and also Marla, who's now screenwriting and, and developing her own projects, to firstly bring our own network of, of colleagues and contacts into this project, into this film festival, but also... We're making so many incredible contacts and um, meeting amazing filmmakers and seeing incredible work being sent through to us. Um, and that feels really, really good as an actor um, because it, um, it allows you to engage with the industry from a totally different angle. And that's been a really valuable insight, I think, for both of us. Absolutely. That has been one of my biggest insights from doing this podcast is being able to engage with industry professionals from a different perspective, not yeah. as like a needy actor, but, you know, just professional to professional, you know, that kind of a thing. And it it does change the game. It changes the dynamics of it. And whether that's just in my head that it's changing the game, it doesn't matter. Somehow the game has been changed. And I notice the connections that I make are deeper, but I mean, possibly it also comes from having being being able to have these kind of deep conversations with people. So yeah. I, I get them alone, you know, be it a casting director, a director, a producer, whoever it is, I get them alone for an hour and I can just sort of 
ask them questions and have a conversation, you know, about something that we're both passionate about. And I think that that's probably similar for you, no? Absolutely. And it's funny because sometimes you don't even realize that you're engaged in conversation with people doing big stuff, you know, like I've been, um, you know, in, in organizing certain films and approaching sales reps or distributors or producers. And, you know, there's just so many. And because we're dealing with a lot who are, um, who aren't Berlin based, obviously they're based in Australia and New Zealand. So, you know, I find that I've like gone through my inbox and realized I've seen a name that I was emailing last year. I'm like, Oh, that, that guy just produced that big film or, Oh, that director's now doing this big thing. And I'm, I've, I've got them in my inbox, you know? Um, and, uh, not that it's something that I sort of feel like I want to use as an actor, like suddenly I'm going to pitch them my show reel or something, but it's just nice to know that, um, there are avenues to, to access these people that we perceive as actors as, you know, VIP, very important kind of um, the gatekeepers of uh, we perceive our success or our next big job. But actually it, it's nice to have conversations with them on another level. And, um, and if in the process I sort of say, oh yeah, my background is as an actor or I trained as an actor, then great. But for me, it's just nice to, um, to foster those relationships and and at some point it might it might open up a door but i don't feel it's interesting i don't feel so much of that actor neediness um yeah. when i do this job i don't really feel like i need to tell everyone uh, you know check out my show reel or oh god no i know? never say check out my show reel but i definitely do let you know just my perspective is as an actor first yeah. as a screenwriter second and I definitely let my perspective be known. So mm -hmm. just by virtue of talking about it, they know I'm an actor. They know I'm a yes. screenwriter. So it yeah. comes up, you know. But I, it's one of the things that I always kind of coach is that people need to have a platform. You need to have something to talk about that's not just acting. You mm -hmm. need to have something that puts you at at eye level, as the Germans say, right? Which is such a great expression. You, you, want, you want to both be at the same eye level. And whether that's, you know, Andrea Schneider, no, the, mm. the actress, yeah? And her thing is All Bodies in Sight, which is for actors who are, you know, bigger. And I think it's for women and men who are, you know, just bigger. And but it's it's not just about that. It's also about actors with disabilities and things like that. And again, that's something that it gives her a whole nother talking point. You know, there there are so and I think there are so many things that are interesting and that we bring to the table, you know, Maybe I'm partial, I don't know. But I think actors are kind of amazing. <laughs> yeah. And we bring so much to the table. You know, we have, we're, yeah. our inch, we're so curious. We're so curious about people. We're so curious about other lives. And, you know, about li and living these other lives. So it makes us curious about different directions that our own lives could have or could take. Yeah. And yeah. and it, it really opens up a lot of conversations. So how long have you been doing the festival now? So this is our second year as the directors or co-directors for Marla and I. And, um, and you know, we have a vision to grow it. We, we don't necessarily expect it to be something massive, but what we want it to do to be as a platform for filmmakers um, from Australia and New Zealand who want to be able to show their work in Berlin, uh, in Europe, and which is a place that obviously not every film gets um, gets shown. You know, distribution is hard to get. It's hard to get a sales rep, and you're pitching against everybody else. And the German market's uh, a good one. And the German market is a great one and Germans yeah. love Australia and New Zealand and, um, and there is a curiosity for 
different stories. And it's great that the venue that we do it at, Movie Mento Kino, is the oldest uh, independent cinema in Germany. So it, it right yeah, it shows a lot of mainstream. from my apartment. <laughs> exactly, in the middle of Kreuzberg. <laughs> yeah. And it's, uh, it's a gorgeous little venue. It and is. Um, it very much is a supporter of festivals like, like ours, you know, cultural festivals. And they show mainstream, but they also show a lot of foreign films and independent films. And they have been a great supporter of us. So secondly, well, running, but we want it, we do want it to grow um, in terms of physical capacity, yes, but also in terms of the scope and um, just that we want to be on the radar of filmmakers down under yes. who, um, who say, hey, look, okay, we don't get into Khan, we don't get into Berlinale, or we don't get into TIFF, but that we are a legitimate platform for people to have their work shown, if they're in Europe, to come, um, to, to present their films. And we are very well connected here with the both of the embassies to people from Berlinale, to people from Screen Australia and the New Zealand Film Commission. And um, we have a lot of relationships and with the Goethe Institute. So it's... Um, it's a great start for us and we want to grow that. So we have something to offer and, um, and that feels really good as an actor to have something else to offer. <laughs> Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. And I think that there's also another aspect about this that I find personally fascinating and that's that the tables have turned because you are now the one judging, <laughs> for lack of a better word. <laughs> You are now the gatekeeper, right? In a sense. I mean, not in a sense, in, in reality. So you are the one saying, yes, this film should be, I would love this film to be in my festival and I would love this film to try for another festival. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, it's, um, it's great that people submit films anyway and we wouldn't ever say that, you know, something, you know, that we're above anything or anyone i think creativity whatever stage is fantastic and yeah. if a film is like shot on an iphone and it's bad lighting and it's bad acting but that's great because somebody is starting something and is just planting a seed so um, do you do a different category for those kind of films for films that are for lack of a better word let's just call them amateur um we don't know. We don't categorize them in that way. I wouldn't. I wouldn't say that we really show any amateur. I would. We, we've shown first-time filmmakers, first-time feature film directors. Um, we've shown student films. I think the main thing for us is that the quality of film is high enough for us to to show an audience. We wouldn't want to show anything that goes below a certain benchmark. Um, but that's not to say that people who are starting out and are making crap work is bad. I think everybody has to start somewhere and creativity. Absolutely. Is, creativity, you know, like if you're going to start acting, you're going to be bad at times and that's fine. For sure. Just keep going. Yeah. But in terms of how we select, we just, we want to have a range of stories, of topics. We want to have, we want to represent obviously indigenous culture. Um, we want to have female filmmakers on board. And I think, I think we're starting to to kind of tick those boxes in a way that not for the sake of ticking a box, but that there are actually brilliant stories and brilliant work coming from all of those categories. For sure. Well, yeah. I'm a, a huge proponent of taking imperfect action. I think, you know, you should just, and you know that, I mean, we've known each other a long time. I think, mm -hmm. you know, sometimes I just jump in and it is what it is, but I figure you have to take that first step. So I commend anybody who writes and shoots and you know gets a feature film through post. That is an incredible feat, or even a short film. That's you know, yeah. it's a lot. It's also nice when we um, because we know, you know, between Marla and I, we know a bunch of filmmakers back home, and um, we've approached a few of them and invited them to submit their films because like a good friend of mine he's um, or two friends of mine are uh, screening their films this year because uh, one last year he couldn't um, screen with us because he was waiting to hear back from Sundance mm. so we had to sort of hold off but now he's kind of free to screen it um, with us and he's coming over to screen it with us next week and then he's going to France and he's doing a screening there 
So he will do a Q and A. And then another friend of mine whose film came out around the same time, this time last year, and it was too soon for us to grab it. So I, I found his email somewhere and I wrote to him and I said, Hey, uh, I don't know if you've had a release in Europe yet, but um, we would love to screen the movie if you're interested. And so we went back and forth and then he was like very happy because he said, Hey, we don't have a sales rep in, in Europe. So that would be a great chance to, to show it there. And it feels so uh, rewarding and satisfying to, um, to approach not just friends, but like directors and producers and say like, we've got a platform, we have something great to offer. And, um, and you know, it's I not... think you hit it right on the head because yeah. it's as actors, I think a lot of times we feel like we're always taking, we want something mm. and it's, it's so important to find a way to give. And this mm. is what you've done. You're giving people a platform. You're giving directors, filmmakers, actors, actresses, you know, all of these different people. You're giving them a platform. And and that I think that's what changes the dynamic, you know? Um, absolutely. Absolutely. And one of the things that I really um what really gets me off, so to speak, is is connecting people and um and so part of our festival, we did it last year, we're doing it again this year, is we have it, we put on a networking event and we invite, you know, colleagues, film people that we know in Berlin, we invite the filmmakers that are in town, any sponsors or people involved in the festivals. And we just have a networking event. And this year we're doing it with the Australian Embassy, which has been fantastic because they support us. And, um, and it just means that people also forge um, new relationships and maybe something great comes out of those. And so it's about showing the work, giving the platform to, to filmmakers and emerging talent, but also a, a space where people can forge these connections and, and hopefully something, um, something great will come out of those meetings. And, um, and, you know, because we're a small uh, festival, we're accessible. We're not some hoity toity, fancy yeah. thing yeah so it's yeah. <laughs> yeah um yeah so how do who does the jury who who is the one picking the films or who is so, the one choosing the prizes i guess i should say the, the jury is the one who's choosing which which films are winning and in which categories well we don't we don't have any competition um in the festival mm. in the past they had done a very light kind of audience voting competition. Um, we haven't done that since we've taken over because, uh, well, firstly, it just adds another element of work that we need to then organize. And with a small team, it was, um, it was hard to add that to the list and it wasn't our priority to com for the films to compete. But also we, we want to focus mostly on the showcasing aspect of it and the presentation of the films rather than it being about um, the best this or the best that. Or, uh, and because we don't, we don't have like 50 films, um, it's pretty much, you know, like best Australian, well, best Australian feature, maybe it was one of five or six films from that year. <laughs> so, and it's really, because the films are so varied, it's just like each selected film is probably serving a specific category that we wanted to show. Um, so we don't, we don't compete, but in terms of who's selecting, um, we divide it into, into the team. So there's Marla and myself as the directors. And then we have a few on our team who, um, will go in and watch a lot of the submissions are short films. So because we get a lot sent through, we will divide those up and then kind of create our own short lists. And then we bring that, um, shortlist together and then from there we select the films and it also depends really on um, like last year we had a lot more submissions so we were able to split say the short film category into two so we had Australian shorts New Zealand shorts and this year there wasn't as many so we've divided uh, decided to combine that as one screening with Australian and New Zealand shorts together and um, but then we thought, well, let's do something new and let's um, because filmmaking isn't just about short films and feature films. It's also documentaries. 
and it's also TV series because that's a huge thing now. So we've introduced this section called the series spotlight and we just wanted to have one session where we could showcase a series, one series from Australia and one series from New Zealand that um, hasn't been aired in Germany before. Um, so audiences probably won't have seen it or heard of it. And, um, and so in my research, I managed to find a really quirky New Zealand series called Kura. And then um, a sort of a friend I know who's, he's an actor, writer, director, has been working for a few years on this uh, mini series called Significant Strangers. And he directed it and acts four characters in mm. this, in this thing. And I just thought it's so, it's so impressive what he's done. And I think it's never been shown in Europe. So we wanted to, to screen that here. Is this the friend that's coming over? Unfortunately, no, he won't, oh. he won't be here for it. But mm. the directors that we've got coming are Michelle Saville, who directed the film called Millie Lies Low, a New Zealand feature film. And that's our opening film. And this was actually at the Berlinale, I think last year. Oh, cool. So she's been, yeah. she's, she's had her Berlinale um, experience and it was such a great film that we thought, well, let's, let's screen it again. And she's based in London, so she's coming over. And then the other director we've got is um, Nadi Shah, who's a Sydney-based director, and his feature film debut is called Everything in Between, which was released about a year ago in Australia. Love and, that title. And, yeah, and it's a gorgeous mm. sort of coming-of-age drama, and he's gonna he's gonna fly in and do a Q and A with us, and yeah, so we're excited that he can finally join us because last year it didn't work out. <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah. So. With the director of Millie Lies Low living in London, what are the prerequisites for getting a film into the Down Under Film Festival? It just needs to be an Australian filmmaker? It doesn't have to actually be made in Australia? Or even is just one actor has to be Australian? What are well, the guidelines? It's interesting because we have had a few films where we've like kind of thought, oh, is it Australian enough? Um, for example... If it's a you know pretty much a British film or pretty much an American film, but there's like one Australian actor and one producer, it's a little bit tricky because it sort of needs to tie in with the, the sort of the theme of it being an Australian and New Zealand film festival, and so we try to we try to sort of find we have to put a line somewhere with how we select, but I would say pretty much if they are an Australian or New Zealand national, regardless of where in the world they're living and working, if they're making stuff, we will definitely consider it. And we've last year we had, for example, like a Australian uh, director who's, uh, who won a BAFTA for his short film. And at the time when they made the film, they were living in New York. It's all kind of New York people and actors and um, beautiful piece. But he and his partner, who she um, helped produce it and, and choreographed a lot of the work in the film, uh, are Australian and they're now Australian based. And so uh, we chose that because it's also showcasing the talent that's coming out, like the export element of the talent export from Australia and New Zealand. Um, but it could also be, for example, you could be a German filmmaker who, who lives in Australia and you made something there. And then because it's relevant, maybe there was something in the film or it was set in Australia or there's a theme to it uh, or you could be a Berlin based filmmaker that's just making stuff here and you're from New Zealand and you did a project and it looks amazing and we'll go up oh, great yeah so yeah. it's kind of a mixture um, but it probably wouldn't really be enough to say oh there was an Australian actor in this film because then we could just screen any Nicole Kidman movie and say it's an Australian <laughs> film festival but True. It, kind of has to, it kind of has to be a little more yeah. than that um, definitely we want there to be some kind of theme or strong connection to Australia or if it's an Australian funded or a New Zealand funded production then sure well I know it's early days you know two years in the grand scheme of things isn't isn't a long time so it's hard to say how it's helped you as an actor or or if it's even helped you as an actor but let's talk about that for a minute. What do you think? Has it helped you? Um, well, okay, if I'm going to be sort of 
get really raw, I would say it's helped me on a personal level because for whatever number of reasons, I, I probably haven't worked as much in the last three years as I had the three years prior. And of course, there are, there are quiet periods in an acting career and then there are busy periods. But with such an extended quiet period, let's say, where there have been some, a couple of jobs every year, but I've been working more in the voice space, that I've had a lot of time to, to question like, well, what, what is being an actor and what does it mean if I'm, when I'm not working and who am I when I'm not working and whatever, you know, large part of my identity was very much connected to this job. Um, I had to really sit down and, and look at it and not, not really make a conclusion in any direction that like, Oh, should I quit or sh am I not an actor now? But just, there was a lot of, reflection on on that and um and also like what is then my creative outlet so that was a big question and and i think the film festival has just come at the perfect time for me personally because for all the reasons we discussed it's just connected me to the industry from a totally different angle and i'm building beautiful relationships not from this needy actors place but just from a legitimate place of wanting to offer this as a platform to creative artists and um and i and i feel like this makes me probably a better actor too because i'm much more relaxed um i feel i feel more empowered and yeah i mean it, it also takes the pressure off acting, always having to be the big thing or the number one thing. And, you know, even when I had moments where I was very close to like throwing in the towel and just saying, I, I quit this acting thing. Something in me was like, you don't have to chuck it all away. It can just, it can be dormant for a little bit and then it will come back. You know, you can have a quiet period and it'll come back in a way that is organic and authentic. And so that's where I kind of, I guess I'm holding space for that, where I say I'm still an artist and I still, um, you know, love the idea of getting a juicy script and a juicy character and getting on a set and doing all of that and having fun. And um, that is still very thrilling to me. Um, but the festival has probably also given me another, another outlet creatively. And in terms of just being having to lead a team and lead a project, so many skills that I have had to, um, to learn and to, to utilize to do that and probably making a whole bunch of mistakes along the way. But uh, it's been a really good journey personally, not just on the professional level, but a personal journey with it. And, um, and I hope that, you know, at the right time, the right role, the right, script and all of that when that aligns i'll be totally energized and excited and and ready to do it and maybe i'll screen that at <laughs> that would be amazing no <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah i i mean there's so much of what you said that that i resonate with first of all i don't think we have expiration dates you know no we're not models and even if we were even that is changing Totally. Right. There's all of these, these hot, you know, um, white hair, mature models. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. There's, there are always going to be human stories to be told. And the point of being a human is the range of a person's life. It's, it's not only valid between the times of 15 and 25, you know, and mm. then it's over. It's the whole thing has value from beginning to end and that whole journey is beautiful we all will hopefully experience a long life filled with more ups than downs and so it's it's wonderful to as as we age into newer perspectives really is what's happening i mean mm. it's you know we stay the same we may look a little different but who we are is who we are but our perspectives change, you know, with every big life ex 
experience that you go through, your, your perspective changes. And even when it's not a huge life event, but even something like this has had a profound impact, has, you know, being the director of this festival, has had a profound impact on your perspective mm. in the world, how mm. you fit into the world, and how you interact within that world, and your value in that world. And I, I think that that's really priceless. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you nailed that. <laughs> yeah, and yeah. it's and it's um, again, it ties back into that feeling of feeling valued, feeling seen, feeling wanted, feeling important, feeling like what you have to offer is interesting and valuable for other people. All the things that we want to be as actors. You know, absolutely. As human beings, right? As I mean, humans, we all want. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you know, so many actors. I've had so, so, so many conversations with actors, and and these themes come up again and again and again of just not not feeling valued, not feeling seen. It can really sort of, you know, it it can be depressing if you let it be. But I also think it can be a, a time to step back and reevaluate. How, how can I still be a storyteller, still be a part of this, this experience of telling stories mm. and in a creative way? And I think that there are so many ways to do it. And that's not to say that you can't be an actor anymore. It's just that I think this old fashioned idea that before it used to be if you did anything else, including waiting tables, you weren't really an actor. And that's just not the case anymore. You know, people are wearing lots of different hats. Yeah. I'm an actor. I'm a moderator. I'm a voiceover artist. I'm a creator. I'm a podcaster. You know, I'm a coach. I, I do. I'm a screenwriter. You know, I'm a mom. I'm a wife. I'm a dog mom. I'm a here. I'm a there. I'm a there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I mean, I started teaching, um, I started teaching yoga classes on the weekends. Yeah. Not for money, but just just because it's something that made sense and felt right and felt good, and um, it felt like people were asking me because I, you know, I've I've done some training and I've been practicing for a while, and people were asking me, well, when are you going to teach? And I was like, oh, I'm not really, I don't, you don't want to listen to me, and who am I to tell you about yoga and stuff? But people kept asking, and then when I started, you know, people were coming, and it's not really anything to do with my acting or my professional life but it's just something that for me or my journey and maybe my spiritual side of life that I like to do and people there don't really know what I do when I'm not doing that <laughs> but obviously oh, interesting yeah you know well one of the biggest things for me because I've been on a real journey this past year of of trying to figure out what acting means to me what drives me and how I can use that to to keep me fueled when I don't feel fueled. Yeah. So if that makes sense, you know. Yeah. And and one of my biggest things is I've realized from the very first time I ever stepped on a stage, it was all about connection. It's about connection for me. It may not be what it is for every other actor, but that's what it is for me. I want to be able to connect in a way with other people, whether I ever meet them or not, but in a way that can show them a side of life so that they know they're not alone, you know, mm -hmm. so that they, so, so that they feel a part of something so that they feel connected also to me in, in some way, even though we may never physically ever meet. And I think that there, there are many ways to do that. It's also important as for actors to write to figure out their why, because that can also help you when you're looking for another venue f for sustainability, right? Especially, I mean, my God, the strike is going on, the writer's strike. Well, they just settled that, but okay, the, the actor's strike is still going on. You know, this existential fear of how am I going to pay my rent and put food yeah. on the table is real. Yeah. It's real. And it's, it just, to me, makes it even more clear that, that 
we have so many talents that are sort of, oh, well, you're just an actor. No, you know, I, I'm a speaker. I'm a communicator. I, I, we can do things as actors that other people would rather streak naked through, you know, a full stadium than get up and give a speech at that full stadium. Whereas I'm like, hey, give me that microphone. <laughs> Move over. <laughs> Someone grab that microphone off. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Where's the electronitron or whatever they call that big screen thing? <laughs> I think it's really important for us to to find ways to be sustainable. And I'm I'm really happy that you have found this as one way to to sustain you so that, you know, when you're not doing this, you're still feeling fulfilled while you're doing it. And when you're not, you still have room in your life. And not only do you have room in your life, you're making the connections you need to be making. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's sort of a double-edged thing. I was coaching this girl the other day and she was saying her job job, her you know, sustainability job is a graphic artist. And I was like, that's brilliant. You should make pitch decks for filmmakers. There you go. Yeah. And she's like, I never thought of that. I was like, hello. First of all, you know, most people are not great at making pitch decks. And, you know, go to Canva, do, do make some templates and sell them, you know, do, do it that way. And then also, but you're connecting with filmmakers mm -hmm. and by, you know, and just because you are an actor, your perspective as an actor is going to come through. They will know you are an actor because it will come up in conversation casually as it should, not in this like, please go into my show reel, please, you know? <laughs> uh, I'm just gonna screen my show reel in the trailers before the film. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Woof, was that good? Should we just put our show reels before we roll each film, just in the trailer, just throw it in? <laughs> or like The Exorcist, right? Have the one frame of your face, yeah. <laughs> you know, every yeah, thousand just frames. Insert yourself yes. into the subconscious mind. Higher, the people. Angus, my yeah. brother. <laughs> <laughs> That's too funny. Yeah. So. Okay, let's talk a little bit about your voiceover. I know you're one of the main voices at the Deutsche Welle, which is amazing because, you know, that's also a sustainability thing, which I sort of have a love-hate relationship with voiceover. I love doing it when I'm there, and I hate is too strong of a word, but I, I feel like it's not creatively fulfilling, and yet the money is so damn good, and it's so easy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So kudos to you on that one. That's an excellent. Well, I mean, the job has been, well, it kind of saved me during COVID because that was, that was my main source of income. Yeah. And it's been a really great job for me to hone my, my voicing skills because we have to basically cold read, you know, 42 minute pieces, um, documentaries or different, you know, 26 minute pieces and, We'll go into the booth. We get a little bit of prep time, but not all the time. And um, and it's often just cold reads and learning how to narrate, how to create a kind of arc with the voice and how to, um, you know, tell a story without it being dramatized. And when you get to do that twice a week or three times a week over a couple of years, then you, you kind of get better at it without even trying just because you... And you, you know, some days are better than others, but um, that's been a really great job in terms of just getting used to the skill and, and, and doing it in different kinds of TV shows. Some are like more upbeat and some are more like documentary style. But then with my freelance voice work, yeah, I know what you mean. It, it can be a, a hate love thing where you get a great gig and it's great money, but um, you know, it's just, it's kind it's of not, boring. You're talking it's about boring. the technical aspects of some medical x-ray machine or something, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Necessary. And, somebody needs it. It's helping somebody. That's good. I try and think of it in those terms, but it's boring, yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And I've had, I've had some of those boring jobs and, um, but I just take them cause I think, okay, I'm going to be in there for maybe an hour and then I'm gone right. and then I get my money. But I've done some really exciting jobs. I was, dubbing a main character in a Norwegian action adventure film 
and uh, we did that over about a week. So I had a session almost every day for a week, and that was really cool because that was with the dubbing. You really have to act. You're using not just your voice but your body. And Jeff Burrell, who directs a bunch of English dubbing in Berlin, and he was he was great because he's an actor as well, so he could direct. Yeah. Yeah. And um, and that was that was a really fun job. And also some the odd animation that I've done has also been really great. I remember I sat down a couple of years ago and I was going through that whole questioning of my acting and where am I going to go and what's happening and and I kind of looked and I just thought, oh, if I actually look at my my spreadsheet, most of my money is coming from voice right now, and it's continued to do so since that point. And I was thinking. All right, so maybe I should just not treat this as it's just like a kind of byproduct of being an actor. That oh yeah, I'm trying to I'm trying to reach for this big acting career, but I do it the odd voiceover on the side. Actually, I am now a working voiceover artist, and I'm doing it every week. How do I feel when I like carry that in myself? That I can I can confidently say that's a that's my job, and and that was kind of a a bit of a pivot moment for me. And I also feel like when I kind of pitch myself as a voice actor, or I kind of send my stuff out, I really feel good and confident um, with what I what I you know I haven't got some crazy voice. Like some people who do animations have some incredible ranges in their voice, and that also takes it's a skill that takes a lot, a lot of work and training. And also, some people just have really interesting voices, just quite naturally. But I feel confident in the voice that I have. Uh, and interestingly, my voice has been something that I was very insecure about as a kid and growing up, and on like a tonal level, but also just on a confidence level in terms of like speaking, speaking my truth, saying what I'm thinking, having the courage to actually speak, and liking the sound of what I have to say and liking the sound of my voice. That has started to change from this, from this kind of job. Which, yeah, just being constantly validated with that paycheck three times a week. <laughs> yeah, a big, I'm like, okay, a I'm big thing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, well, it also goes to what you what we were talking about earlier. With neither one of us are in our twenties, right? So we have this. Uh, I think we both grew up at times where people think that where we used to think that actors have to wear one hat. So I can totally understand why you would have that attitude about voice work. That was always my attitude. I mean, that, that was my main, well, acting, uh, voice acting and presenting was my main thing for 16 years as I was raising Mark, my, my son. I, I would always correct people. You know, they would say, because in Germany, as you know, they call you a Sprecherin, which means Sprecher, speaker, right? A Sprecherin, Sprecher. So, which means speaker. And... And I would always say, no, I'm an actor. You know, we don't differentiate. <laughs> I'm an actor. And it just used to piss me off, to be very honest. But it was because I had like a chip on my shoulder about it. You know, I felt like a little bit less than. Like, you know, just because I'm not doing films and TV right now doesn't mean, or I'm not, you know, in some theater somewhere doesn't mean I'm, I'm less than. It, I'm still an actor. I understand that. But again, you know, I think that we all need to diversify and look for different ways to be creative and to express ourselves. And some of the most fun creative jobs I had, you know, I did, I did two, three, I did three kids uh, television series where I had the lead in all three. And I did, oh my gosh, I did a bunch of feature films, kids animated feature films. And those were a ton of fun. You know, and I am one of those people, but maybe it comes from having a, a child who does the funny voices and stuff. When Mark used to have his friends come over, it started out because I was doing, I don't know if you would even know it. Do you know Felix, that little rabbit that goes around with his suitcase? Oh, I know, I know. It's, no, I don't it's know. a very German thing. It's Felix. Yeah, yeah. Letters from Felix, I think is the name of it in, in German or in English. I don't know. Letters from Felix. And he's this little rabbit that gets left at an airport by... Sophie, his girl. <laughs> and then he writes her letters about all his adventures as he travels the world trying to get back to her. And so I played Felix. And so when Mark was growing up, Felix was a big thing. Of course, I played Felix in English, in the original version, I might add, which because they drew all of the animations to our voices because yeah. English was much easier, you know, 
when you're sending out the animations to be drawn in Vietnam or in India or wherever they were doing them than it is for German. So we were doing the original voices. So, 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 so if I stuttered, right, then he would then he would have to be drawn in stuttering. Or and then the Germans dubbed over that and, and everybody else because it was dubbed into a bunch of different languages <laughs> when mark was little he, he and his friends used to be mama do the voice do the voice do the voice and then he then he would as a young teenager like 11 12 when he was cool you know he'd be like mom if you do that voice in front of my friends <laughs> i will never forgive you <laughs> So, of course, you did it. Yeah, of course, of course, yeah. Have to do it. I was like, I'm going to do the voice. Don't do it, Mama. <laughs> Angus, is there anything else that we haven't covered that you would like to cover? Oh, I would just say, well, people should definitely, if they're in Berlin, come to the film festival. Which Give us is, the date. It's from the 11th to the 14th of October at Movie Mento Kino in Kreuzberg in Berlin and we're gonna have like opening night we've got the New Zealand embassy there we're gonna have some like free drinks and some snacks and pies and we've got the director coming and we've got closing night similar kind of closing night reception and there'll be some directors and Q&A's and we've oh we've actually got a really cool event which is called From Down Under to Deutschland. And it's going to be on Saturday the 14th at the Kino. And basically we've got uh, four people on our panel, um, a couple of writer-directors, a screenwriter and an actress from Australia and New Zealand. And it's a one-hour panel talk about a lot of what we covered, but just the journey from growing up in Australia or New Zealand and, and pursuing a creative career in film overseas and in specifically in Germany, where these people are living and working. And I think it'll be really interesting for anyone who wants a bit of inspiration from people who have done it, are doing it, working various avenues within the field for young filmmakers and come and meet these people. It's a great place just to meet. So whoever's in Berlin, it would be great to see you. Wonderful. How can people get a hold of you? They can reach out on Instagram. The film festival is at Down Under Fest on Instagram. And our website is downunderberlin.de. If they type in my name in Instagram, they'll find me, Angus McGruther. I'll just pop up. That's where I kind of hang out. That sounds good. Well, Angus, once again, thank you so much. And for those of you watching or listening today, make sure to mention in the comments what your biggest takeaways were from our conversation. We kind of covered the whole gamut, so I'd love to know what resonated <laughs> with you. And until next week, you stay your bold and beautiful self. Bye-bye.